again, you're watching or listening to the Daily Bit. Today's Daily Bit number 78. It is Thursday, April 5th, and Mark Carpellis has entered the frying pan. So the reason that the title is structured as it is today, yesterday Mark went on Reddit into an area, so also some context too. He's the former CEO of Mt. Gox, and yesterday Mark went on Reddit into the crypto community and did an impromptu AMA, and he entered the frying pan. I say that because... He, there's a lot of animosity towards Mark because of what happened with Mt. Gox and the whole implosion and the fact that he lost millions and millions of dollars for all of these people that were invested into the company. So again, he um, basically just said, hey, look, like I'm here. Ask me anything. Let's, let's kind of get going on. And that's our main story for the day, but that's really just the context again behind the title. Again, disclaimer, this isn't financial advice, long story short. And again, if you want, to, if you want financial advice, talk to somebody else that actually is certified. This is just reviewing the events for the day. So that's really all. <clears throat> Again, if you want to subscribe, check out the Daily Bit. Check out our website. Email address. Plug it in right there. And you guys will get locked in for our newsletter Monday through Friday. I'm going to try to go through things pretty quickly today. I have a couple items that I'm working on. I uh, I have this interview. I have these two interviews lined up with the, these two companies or these two blockchain projects that I'm trying to get out, trying to get questions over to them by the end of the weekend. So... Really just uh, got a lot of things going on today. But again, we're going to go through the same format for Word on the Street. It is Between Two Fates with Mark Cabela's for Where's Blockchain. We're looking at a cell phone that is in the space that's recently launched or, or due to launch. We're going to see what's going on there. For Bulls and Bears, when there's a will, there's a way. We're going to look at OTC again and specifically the Chinese markets and what's going on there. And then for our bear side, we have Georgia and the bad news that just got recently hit was just recently received by the Peach State and for education we're looking at consensus mechanisms and this is actually going to be a rolling educational thing that we're going to launch or I, I guess release per se over the next couple of days in the daily bit. Now for the tweet of the day this is coming from Jameson Lop. Now Jameson said if you approach Bitcoin as if it's just a and then he rattled off a couple items a currency, a company, a database, a democracy the point is Coinbase is an ever-changing enigma, and the fact that it started off as one item with the initial development team and then has kind of transitioned into this kind of constantly flowing, constantly changing entity or idea or, or, or store value, whatever it might be. But the thing is that Bitcoin is always changing, so you can't really approach it with one mindset and in one mode of thought. You always have to be flexible. You have to be willing to adapt your idea or perception of Bitcoin and what it is achieving and what it's accomplishing in the industry and what it's also accomplishing in society as well. So just keep that in mind. It's just being open mind being open minded about what's going on here. The fact that it's also an open source protocol means that there are going to be developers coming in with these different modes of thought, different ideas that are always going to be tested. So again, you, you can't you can't just say you can't be stubborn about how you perceive Bitcoin because ultimately you're going there's going to be some dissonance in that dissonance eventually between what you think and what's actually happening in, in the community. So just be aware of that. That's really all there for Tweet of the Day. Now going on to Word on the Street. Between two fates. So again, like I mentioned, Mark just Mark went over to Reddit for an AMA. And again, the first thing he did, he was like, look guys, I messed up with the way well, I managed Mount Gox towards the end. I'm sorry about that. And again, like I'm trying, I'm on your side. I'm trying to get your funds over to you as quickly as possible. And well, by quickly as possible, he means that he Mark wants to he wants to make this a civil rehabilitation process instead of going through traditional bankruptcy laws in Japan, which, according to those laws, and also apparently a lot of other countries in the world do this as well. That's what Mark outlined in his AMA post that the way that out, the way the bankruptcy law is set up is that the creditors have to be rewarded the the um, the price that the the price of Bitcoin was in 2014. So it doesn't matter that it's gone above and beyond that price since since 2014. It's been about four years or so. The the date that or the, the date that the bankruptcy was filed in 2014, that's the price that was locked in. That's the price that they would be compensated for. So anything after that, just that's just the period of time. So I mean it's it's different and kind of difficult to stomach that or swallow that because of the fact that this is a very unique financial instrument and an asset that we're dealing with, currency that we're dealing with, Bitcoin. 
this was a bond, if this was a stock, if this was most other items, maybe real estate would appreciate more. But then again, it, it really depends. Just the growth rate here is just very, very peculiar. And that's really why this is kind of blown up into such a controversy. Some some Redditors that commented, there there are people that weren't even able weren't even able to file in time that have lost upwards of 200 BTC. I'm sure that isn't even the highest amount, but these people lost millions of dollars in the bankruptcy filing or, or as a result of Mt. Gox imploding. So again, Mark understands that, look, like he messed up here. He, he should not be worthy of a billion dollar payout. And that's just the way that the, the court kind of sees it. Once that initial capital or that initial compensation, or, or I guess like um, balance, that these uh, that these creditors have have with Mt. Gox, any excess is distributed to the shareholders of the company. And shareholders right now are to Bain Ltd. I'm not too familiar with the company, but Mark is the only shareholder of to Bain, and he gets 88 percent of Mt. Gox. The other 12 percent of Mt. Gox is allotted to Jed McKellar. So again, there's only two shareholders. McKellar is already fine. He's the CEO of Stellar Lumens. He doesn't need the money. I'm not really sure what he's going to do with that. I, Mark, I believe, mentioned that he's not really sure that Jed is interested either. But again, so that really leaves Mark as, as the main person here. And the fact that he's bankrupt and the fact that Tobain is bankrupt means that there's several layers in between the first person that gets to say something and Carpellis. So that's why he his hands are basically tied during this whole process. And that's why he's saying, look, like I can't really do anything right now. I'm on your side. I'm trying. I'm doing everything I can to get you your money. But again, just like this is this is really what's going on here. So again, the only way that this could really happen is if a uh, civil rehabilitation is approved. I mean, realistically, if Mark explains also, if, if he were to, if if this doesn't go the way he intends it to, and other people intend it to, and he would receive the payout initially, there's going to be taxes. There's going there's going to be fees, expenses that have to be chopped away from that balance that Mark receives before he can send it over to any of these creditors. So again, that's also going to get hacked away as well when that's exchanged over. So there, there would be a much smaller balance than these, than these creditors would receive if they just went and were able to get this civil rehabilitation process approved. So that's really that. And again, there's there are a couple takeaways. I thought that this was a good main story just because anybody that's really unfamiliar with Mt. Gox, this does, this does a really good job of covering everything here. If you want to get insight into the full AMA, then definitely check out Reddit. You should be able to follow. Well, check out check out Reddit. It's it's going to be one of the top posts within cryptocurrency subreddits. But again, whether or not the trustee the trustee for Mount for the Mount Gox estate has full control over Bitcoin right over the Bitcoin right now, and there was news that broke a couple weeks ago saying that the trustee sold some sold a good chunk of that Bitcoin and that led to many media outlets reporting that the selling of that Bitcoin led to a decline in the markets but ultimately that's not really what many people believe led to the slide into the markets. So it's only a substantial amount it's only a, a minute amount of the total circulating supply that's being bought and sold so again it's it's just something to kind of it's really just a scapegoat to uh, I, I guess better understand why or, or predict why the markets did slide, but obviously people are concerned that that Bitcoin is not sold because who knows? Maybe these maybe these creditors want to retain their Bitcoin. They might think it goes up. So again, there's not really much action that's going to happen there until this this civil rehabilitation. There's better understanding about what's going on here. For his ability to move the case to civil rehab, again, it's out of his hands. He is bankrupt. He doesn't really have a say until other people get involved in the process. And then for the investors that missed the deadline as a creditor, if it does go to civil, a civil rehabilitation process, then they would potentially be able to refile and claim their losses in that process. So they're currently not in it. There were a couple people on Reddit who commented, hey, like, look, I lost a lot of Bitcoin in the Mt. Gox implosion, but I didn't file in time. What's going on here? That's really what they'd be able to do. So again, there's a good chance that can happen. It just matters whether or not this this ultimately goes through and gets pushed through the system. For where's blockchain? We have calling all crypto fans, but will they answer? So obviously there's a cell phone pun in here, and the reason for that is because Siren Labs they had an ICO in December. They raised a a good chunk of cash. I believe it's 158 million dollars. It's on the next page. But again, they're rolling out a line of cell phone devices called the Finny, and Scheduled launch is October 2018, but this is a this is a cell phone that has 
that has blockchain technology embedded within it. So again, it's a blockchain secure smartphone. And the idea here is that the current security for, for cryptocurrencies, if you want to store anything in the cold wallet, if you want to move stuff onto an exchange and then move it off an exchange, put in a transaction, put it in a receiving address, uh, make sure that that receiving address, receiving address is accurate, make sure that you're not hacked, make sure that everything goes according to plan. If you're not technologically savvy, this is going to be challenging for you. It's so, again, the idea here is that everything's going to be secure on your phone, so you don't have to worry about storage, you don't have to worry about transfers, you don't have to worry about purchases, and then it's going to be compatible with companies like Overstock or, shucks, I don't know, any other company that really accepts cryptocurrencies here. And again, it looks like Cardano is going to be compatible with the Finney. And Virgo, I believe, is a Japanese software company or developer company that is working with Siren Labs. And again, Foxconn Technology Group, they're the world's largest electronics manufacturer for hire. Their subsidiary is helping to develop and produce Finney devices. So again, this is something that recently, this is news that recently broke. And again, they're, they're, they're already set for production. This is good for, this is good for Siren Labs. Obviously, they're locking up deals, they're securing deals to make sure that 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 their phones are starting to get in the pipeline and they're going to be produced and hit the market because right now there are two competitors if you check the original Bloomberg article I, I forgot to write about this I guess I was just strapped for time and uh, well I was strapped for time for getting out the paper this morning so I, I wasn't able to mention it I just I just based on mentioning the other two competitors but there are two other blockchain products for or, or mobile phones that have, have blockchain that, that have blockchain technology embedded within them so again Finney isn't the only one out there, so it's very, very important, of course, that they hit the market. They make sure that that uh, consumers get their eyeballs on this phone, figure out what they like, what they don't like, and make sure that they can start selling these products or else sooner or later they don't want to get left behind and basically just join the ranks of ICOs that are in the graveyard and have already flunked in 2018 from 2017. So again, right now there's a poor user experience. It's complex. Hopefully the Finney will fix that. And the details again, 158 mil was raised in a December IPO or ICO. And eight stores are targeted in crypto active communities for the release. Again, this makes sense. You're not going to go to an area where you're not going to release this in an area where nobody knows about Bitcoin. So again, you're targeting your markets, you're targeting your demographic and your geographical areas where this could actually have some success and take off. Twenty-five thousand order units have been pre-ordered. They're shooting for a couple a hundred thousand to a couple million I mean for year one so again whether or not that happens we'll see what you should watch here is whether or not demand is going to be eaten up or the supply is going to be eaten up by demand on opening day over the course of the next several days I mean the retail price is thousand dollars but again so is the iPhone X so if people really if people want to swap out their facial recognition technology for blockchain technology then I mean, the, the Finney could take off here. And again, as cryptocurrencies become more popular, as there are use cases, right now there aren't really many use cases, so it's going to be a t it's going to this is going to be a tougher sell in the market because nobody really needs to have a blockchain technology, uh, I guess, savvy phone. People want to be able to do stuff with the iPhone. So right now, it seems like the iPhone, and clearly it's going to, Clearly, the iPhone isn't going away anytime soon. This would really take a sliver, probably from like Android devices and, and other devices as well, potentially the iPhone as well. But really, in order for that to happen, there has to be a larger sample size of of people that are in the market for these products. And again, there's a huge risk. Eh, well, maybe it's not a huge risk, but another risk to consider is that when people are walking around with Finny phones that are clearly distinguishable, look at that camera. It's it's clearly not an iPhone. If Robbers know what these phones look like, and they see somebody with a Finney phone. They could just be on their radar for a potential heist or a potential or a potential robbery in the future. And again, if you have all of your information secured in there, I'm sure there's going to be additional security features. But you don't want to get robbed, or get or yeah, you don't want to get robbed just because you have one of these phones. If you have an iPhone and you're waving that around in the streets, nobody's going to instantly assume that you have hordes and hordes of crypto. On your phone, and also if you're buying one of these for a thousand bucks, it's it's fair to assume that you're going to have a good amount on you, somewhere in your wealth. So again, we'll see how the Finney goes. Again, October 2018. What else you should read today? We're gonna look at. We're gonna go into a little more detail on Iran's ban of Telegram's ICO, but for the otherwise, 
So just going to run through these. A Bitcoin wallet for the Lightning Network is available on Google Play. That came out on Twitter the other day. I really don't think many media outlets have announced this yet. I just saw something on Twitter. It's on the GitHub page. You can download it again for Android. And again, if, you, if you're looking for secure, quicker transactions on the Bitcoin network, you can potentially do it with Lightning now. But again, understand that it's still very early on. There could be bugs. There's risks, as there is with any speculative assets. So just keep in mind with that. Just keep aware of what's going on. Iran banned Telegram's ICO. We're going to look into that more. On the next slide... There are, these bit, there are these Bitcoin ATMs that have been popping up everywhere in the United States, I believe in the rest of the world too, but right now, 15 U.S. states, news broke yesterday that there are now 15 states that have them, there's 85 million people within those states that have access to a Bitcoin ATM. Obviously, there's not going to be a line down the block, but if you're walking around these areas, you have a better chance of running into a Bitcoin ATM than one of the other 35 states, no doubt. So, again, that's that. The Bond King, Jeffrey Gunlatch, so I have no idea who Jeffrey is until I've, I've read this article, but apparently he's been in the financial markets for a very long time, of course, and he is now short equities due to rising bond yields and the crypto dip that keeps on dipping. So again, Jeffrey wrote an article, or, or was mentioned in, I believe, a Reuters or Bloomberg article the other day, where he believes that the cryptocurrency market is a leading indicator for the direction of the stock market. So the fact that cryptocurrencies has kind of deep, the cryptocurrency market cap is deflating right now, the total market cap is somewhere around 250 billion. But because it's just been sliding from around highs of 830 billion, because of that, he really thinks that the stock market is headed in the same direction. And because of his experience and prowess with bonds, He's expecting that again. This is just another reason to believe that equities are on the downward, on the downward slide. So, that's that. A very cool project that I've encountered in the past couple of days is this idea of audio white papers. So, if you're, I think we mentioned them in in a stream earlier this week. But again, if you're not a reader, if you fall asleep and are trying to read technical stuff, I'm sure a lot of people do because again, it's like reading the dictionary. It's not that fun. There's this company that is. That is reading these white papers to you. So again, if you want to go on YouTube, if you, I don't know if they have a kind of a SoundCloud or a, a podcast kind of type thing here. But again, if you want to listen to the white papers, click that link. This one is Nano. It's a very popular cryptocurrency project. I'm not invested in Nano. Again, I haven't really been trading anything. But I would love to get my hands on some Nano. But again, I'm just really focused on writing the paper learning about the space, and I'm not really concerned about data day trading because I just don't have time to focus on that right now. Fundamental challenges with public blockchains. This is another article that I still need to read. I really need to find time for this. It's, 20 min it's a 29-minute read according to Medium, but again, the author has a huge following. I believe she's a software developer. Forgetting the name, my apologies, but again, really great read if you're trying to understand what's going on with blockchains. If you want a primer on blockchains, I'm sure this is a great way to get that. And reviewing the history of money. This is another Medium article published in Hacker Noon. Again, the history of money, just looking at the progression. So, again, if you want kind of a history lesson, if you're a history junkie, great chance to get your hands on that. And seeing how Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies could potentially fit into that timeline for the future. Not necessarily saying that they will, but saying this is how they potentially could kind of mesh into that whole structure and, time, and um, I guess, framework. Again, so Iranian officials banned Telegram's ICO. So why did they do this? Hassan Firuzabadi, he's Iran's high counsel for cyberspace. The reason that they're doing this is, of course, they're con Iran is concerned that Telegram's currency, the gram, is going to undermine Iran's national currency. And, I mean, we've seen other countries do this with cryptocurrencies where they really do think, look, like, central banks don't want Bitcoin to be used. Stores don't want, well, I guess stores want Bitcoin to be used. But the idea is anywhere where there's a government-issued fiat currency, there's a concern that people are going to start using these cryptocurrencies in Bitcoin, and it's going to decrease the demand for their currencies. And in, in, in effect, that's going to drag down the entire economy or their domestic economy, their output, whatever it might be, because their currency is perceived to be less valuable and actually is less valuable if people are focusing their attention and their usage with these other products. So, again... Hassan was quoted as saying, look, Telegram is not a dominant messenger in any country except for Iran. So that's also a huge concern, too. The fact that Iran is the, is the hub for Telegram means that most of the users are in Iran. So there's a heightened risk. This is a, this is a larger risk for, I, I guess, their national currency than any other 
than any other country that doesn't have as large of a presence with Telegram. So again, Telegram has officially announced that it will be used as an economic platform with their brand and their ICO offering, 1.7 billion. Again, remember, there's a lot of people that are hyped up about this. I personally think, just as a quick aside, that the, the ICO is a, a terrible idea if you're an investor. I just don't see there, how there's any value because it's very centralized. But again, I haven't read the white paper. I don't know much. I'm just reading what I've seen in the news from other professionals and just kind of putting in my expectations of, of kind of what could happen here. And again, Telegram will undermine, undermine Iran's national currency. And of course, it can't allow it to enter the country because of that. And Hassan predicts that the virtual money's timeline, the, the grand, is going to be 10 years. I find this interesting. I added this in as an additional quote because Jack Dorsey of Twitter, I mean, he's the CEO of CEO, founder of Twitter, Squarespace. Jack thinks in 10 years, Bitcoin is going to be the only currency, the, on, the only currency of the Internet. So, again, there's one side where people think, where Iran and their officials think that, look, like this is only going to be around for 10 years. It's going to do this much damage to our economy. It's going to take away this much attention from our currency. And after that, we're going to be good as gravy. I, I, I believe that's what the, the idea here is. And then there's Jack on the flip side that thinks, look, your currency's gone in 10 years, and, and these, maybe not the, maybe not the gram is going to be around, but there's going to be a digital currency or, or a cryptocurrency that's going to kind of take the reins here and start controlling everything. So again, that just shows that there's still a huge range of, of ideologies in the space, and there's critics, there's believers, there's, there's, and there's many people in between that range. So again, it's, it's, it's hard to say what's going on here, but getting a good idea of, of how people are thinking about this and how other countries and where other countries fit into this mold too. I believe Chile and potentially Brazil is also very, uh, I, I want to say antagonistic, but uh, against cryptocurrencies and their issuances. So again, if they think that there is going to be a project that comes in that has a very, very big presence in the country and they potentially release their own digital currency, you can see some backlash of similar nature to that Telegram is receiving with within Iran. So again, it's all about attention. It's all about what people are going to use and ultimately how is that going to impact the economy? Are they concerned? Are they trying to work with the currency? Because if Iran was like, look, like let's let's try to figure something out. Let's try to make it possible to I don't know, integrate the gram some way. I'm I'm not really sure how that would happen. But again, just if, if this country is if, if the project is willing to work with the regulators in that country, there is a much higher chance that or at least in my eyes, that things are going to be worked out and they're not going to get banned or banished like Telegram is right now. So again, that's that's really what's going on with the space, what's really happening with some of these projects. Bulls and bears. <clears throat> when there's a will, there's a way. And the will here is for Chinese citizens to purchase and own cryptocurrencies. And obviously, as we've seen, China has not been to... China's kind of taken the same stance as Iran. They're really against the use of public cryptocurrencies and public blockchains. China's obviously producing their own central bank-backed digital currency. They're looking at their own blockchain. They're exploring blockchain technology in their own light. But again, because there's so many... Because there's so much hate for public currency, for cryptocurrencies, the PBOC has gone there, has done their fair share of banning digital currencies in the country and because of that there's there's a red hot demand within with the citizens they haven't forgotten that that rush that drive that, that need for or want for for digital currencies and because of that these markets have popped up in the OTC the OTC markets have sprung up uh, I guess more so and there's these Bitcoin mules that are going into China or going into these other countries see going into these other countries purchasing cryptocurrencies in these countries and going over to these Chinese citizens saying, hey, look, like I have basically opening up their jacket saying, hey, look, I got Bitcoin, I got Ethereum, I got Litecoin, I got Dash, which, by the way, I just got this hat. I don't own any. Um, I got EOS. I don't know what they have, but literally, like, you can, if you, there's there's these markets that these, these underground markets are popping up, and these traders are facilitating these exchanges, and they're getting some pretty solid premiums. This is similar to the kimchi premium in South Korea last year towards the latter half of 2017 where we were seeing... 30 to 50 percent premiums on some of these currencies because people were expecting them to flip 10x. People were expecting them to go up a substantial amount. So again, if you if you to go about this process, I mean, if there's obviously a huge risk if you get caught. You're probably going to jail. You're probably going to get fined. Again, but you would have to go to countries that have lax regulated 
re lax regulations within the within the cryptocurrency space within the within the industry, and then sell them in areas where there's kind of less availability, there's less opportunity to purchase them. That will drive up the price. That scarcity drives up the price even more. So again, or you could just go to lesser known exchanges where I'm sure there's not where, where the idea here, at least in my eyes, is that there's not going to be as much demand, so you're going to be able to have lower prices, and all that volume isn't going to be driving up the price, whereas that would that's what really would happen on larger exchanges. So again, that's that's two ways to go about it. The R, the ROIs these days are, is closer to 7% or less, according to Reuters and Bloomberg, because of the fact that there's so many mules that are entering the market, they're thinking, hey, look, like let me get involved in this, let me get my cut, let me get my share. And there's hedge funds working on these geographical arbitrage opportunities. There's independent traders that are working on these arbitrage opportunities. There's 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 multiple ways that you can kind of benefit from this imbalance with regulation in throughout the world within the market. And again, there's a couple of avenues that people are using here. You can do the traditional meetups. You you go meet somebody in person. You go to a shop, whatever, and just facilitate. Here's the cash. Here's the crypto. And you go you go in your different ways. You can use CoinCola, Taobao, Alipay, WeChat. These are all companies that Chinese citizens frequent and use very much. Uh, a retail, I believe Taobao, it, Taobao is a retail platform in China. But again, you can also just use a bank transfer. Send cash over to somebody and again, just get crypto sent over to your wallet. It's really, really difficult for regulators to pin the tail on a donkey and say, hey, look, you just transferred money over to them and they're synonymous. We figured out that they have a synonymous trading account for a similar balance, it's probably going to be a premium too. So again, the, the balance, even the exchange, at the time, if you were to, if you, if the uh, if regulators were trying to say or, or connect, like let's say a, a thousand dollar bank transfer to a, I don't know, eight hundred dollar transfer of cryptocurrencies to a, an account that can't even be tied to an actual name, or would have difficulty being tied to an to an actual name, it's hard to be like, look, this is. We know this is because of cryptocurrencies. Like, we got you. It, they they really can't. So there's bank transfers are even more, or, or even simpler. Or, eh, maybe not simpler. I'm not really sure what the process is, but it, it helps cloak the identities of people and help make these OTC markets possible. So again, there's there's really an underground market for everything. There's a black market for everything as long as there's a demand. People do not care about going. Well, they care obviously, but people are willing to take on that risk if they think there's. If, if they're um, if they want the profit and they want the money, so I mean, if there's uh, if there's an uptick in the markets again eventually, and I, I think there definitely will be. Whether or not that happens, we'll see. But again, I'm sure that the my expectation would be that the premium would be going up here again if if we see an increase in prices because that's when people are going to realize, oh look, like if I, I have to get in early or if I get in early, then I'll be able to sell for even more of a profit. So again, it's just showing like what's the rationale for demanding. Or, or paying for these premiums on on these currencies. So again, as long as there's a mark, as long as there's a demand, there's a market. That's that's how it's going to be. And there's a will, there's a way. Bad news for the Peach State, Georgia. So there's there's a lot of states in the United. There's a, co a couple states on U.S. soil that are trying to get blockchain laws passed in their in their legislatures, and this could this could range from just using the technology to make sure that they're able to track their data and manage their their databases more effectively just make sure that they can reduce costs make sure that there's a censorship censorship resistant uh, database whatever it is um, and there's also a, a desire to be able to pay for your taxes in cryptocurrencies or using cryptocurrencies and right now that's not going to happen in Georgia their Senate bill 464 didn't make the cut for this season's legislative for this season's legislative sessions and one of the main reasons for that is because there's not really these lawmakers still really don't know what's going on. One of the proponents of the bill, I forget his name, or, or he, he's just not listed in the slide. So apologies for that. But he was mentioning that a lot of lawmakers that he was speaking with, they brought up the fact that oh, aren't digital currencies, aren't Bitcoin used for the purchase of drugs? So I mean, it's going back to the Silk Road days. It's going back to these these darknet markets, which for the most part, a lot of those have been shut down, but still, again, there's not really a use case right now, so people are thinking, like, this is just vaporware, this is just an idea that people, like, it's, it's, this is just an idea that people have, like, not fabricated, but kind of constructed and produced, but there's no use case right now, so once this is, this, once this is made into effect and people can actually pay for their taxes in cryptocurrencies, that's a legitimate use case that gives people 
a, a prerogative or a reason to actually purchase these currencies and pay for their taxes with them. So again, about as to whether or not it's going to, I'm sure, or, or my, again, I, I can't be sure because I haven't done my research, but my gut feeling is that paying for your taxes with cryptos is going to be easier than going to TurboTax and paying with dollars, or it's going to be quicker, it's going to be cheaper. There, there's obviously, or my expectation would be that there's going to be benefits that you would be able to gain by using cryptocurrencies for your taxes. So again, once states start adopting these this technology and this um, this payment system for taxes, that's going to widen the market, widen the amount of people that are A, aware of cryptocurrencies and B, willing to or interested in purchasing them because they just know that it's going to be easier for, for their tax season, come tax season. That's really it. And how do you do that? Well, the next session resumes in nine months. So right now, impregnate legislators, impregnate the public with benefits of blockchain, let them know about everything, teach them, educate them, have conversations within their community, on panels, forums, whatever it is, make people aware of the benefits of tech, of the tech, so by the time sessions resume, people are going to say, hey, look, we have to get this in front of the eyes of the Senate because there's actually a lot we can, there's many, many ways we can benefit from this tech once, if we do get it passed. So again, that's really what the, that's really what the, the goal is here right now. All right, so for education, consensus mechanisms. We are going to start rolling out a, well, we're going to be looking at a unique consensus mechanism for the next couple of days uh, for the paper. So tomorrow we're going to, I'm not going to say which one we're looking at, but I'm working on that right now. I'm going to start collecting some consensus mechanisms that I'm not as familiar with and I'm sure people aren't as familiar with. So again, it's not going to be proof of stake, proof of work that, um, I guess are more familiar, more popular in the space. We're going to be looking at the ones that are younger, uh, have have less, uh, I, I guess aren't as popular, again, within the community. But again, what is, so, sorry, I'm all over the place. The idea here is like, all right, so what is a consensus mechanism? Like from the top, like what are we talking about here? Again, a consensus mechanism, it's a way to guarantee that there's a mutual agreement on a data point. It all goes back to cri crypto economic incentives within the actual crypto within the cryptographic protocol that's being used for the token. So again, let's say you were taking a test here, one of 500 people in a classroom, and everybody's taking their test. It's, there's writing involved. There's there's a bunch of stuff going on here. So well, a consensus mechanism for a classroom theoretically would be able to, let's say, <clears throat> leave everybody using like this magical pencil or this this like they all have the same brain or like whatever it is. Everybody would submit the same exact test, so that would drive the teacher insane, but also it would show that there was a consensus about what the answers are going to be for that exam. There's not one piece, not one of those 500 students changed a even a letter, a number, whatever it is. Everything is verbatim, same exact thing. So that's the idea with the consensus mechanism, and that makes sure that everybody in the network, again, has a copy of the same ledger. Should be ledger, apologies. But again, <clears throat> different consensus mechanisms, they impact the they they impact they impact <clears throat> the crypto economic, the cryptographic protocol and this cryptography in a different way. It impacts security and the economic framework, which is like the code of conduct, like what steps are going to be impacted. So again, there's different structures that go on and there's different kind of game th it's it's more reverse game theory if we actually look at it, but there's different things going on and different factors at play here that will all shape and distort the security and the framework within these, I guess, projects in, in different ways. And when we look at that, is there one mechanism to rule them all? Is there one mechanism to rule them all? To rule them all? No, there isn't. There really isn't. I mean, there's definitely going to be a lot of arguments within, I guess, uh, development um, amongst developers and among the community that say, hey, look, like proof of work is better because of this, proof of stake is better because of this, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people think that proof of stake is, is not that great because of the energy requirements. I personally think that it's definitely true that there is uh, a, a large amount of electrical consumption that is used with proof of work. But again, right now, uh, apparently that is... The, the desired method and the most effective method for Bitcoins, for, I guess, Bitcoin's consensus mechanism. I do not know much about it, so I'm going to end my discussion about that there. I'm not going to talk about stuff I don't know. I'm just going to talk about just generally 
my understanding of what's going on here. So again, consensus mechanisms are like a box of chocolates, and when you give them to, when, when different people have these chocolates, one person could say the, I don't know, the, the chocolate eclair is great, or I don't even know if that's a piece of chocolate, but one person, like, it depends on the palate. If your palate is going to enjoy one flavor more than another, then you're going to say that you like these you like this one versus another. It, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and how everything is, is ultimately intended to pan out with this, within the system. So again, it's early in the process. It's hard to say which one is going to be the most popular. And again, you have to look at the mechanism design that you're trying to achieve within this, within this blockchain project, within this, within this cryptographic token. Again, these projects have a diff these projects have different ideas. There's different incentives that you're trying to achieve with each of these blockchain projects because not everything is trying to be a cryptocurrency or facilitate a means of exchange of a monetary unit. There's some of these blockchain projects that are trying to facilitate or are working to facilitate the exchange of other information that isn't necessarily a currency. They're trying to make sure that there's a utility that there's a utility achieved with some of these projects. Some of them are example file can Filecoin is a decentralized storage system. They're not necessarily I'm not sure what their consensus mechanism is. I'll take a look into that. But again, they might, Filecoin may not necessarily have the same consensus mechanism as Bitcoin. Ethereum wants to use proof of stake because they have their reasons for using proof of stake rather than proof of work. Right now, it's still proof of work, to my knowledge. But again, it's there's different outcomes that are desired, and you have to look at it. You have to look at everything from a mechanism design perspective. And once you understand the desired outcome and the like, what you want to achieve with this consensus mechanism, then you would work backwards in this kind of inverse game theory concept where you're trying to see, all right, like how are we going to structure this so the players involved, the miners, or whoever is kind of running the nodes within the system are going to be able to fulfill that outcome in the game. So again, for people with math backgrounds, I have a, I, I took math research in high school for I think three or four years, and I've always been, I guess I've always enjoyed math. So this is right up my alley. Um, I, I really want to take a look deeper into mechanism design, go down the rabbit hole a little more into governance of these cryptographic projects and these cryptocurrencies and kind of the the cryptoeconomic incentives that really go on here. So again, right now that's just those are just a bunch of I guess buzzwords for for most people. I'm just I'm still getting familiar with them. So again, I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't want to confuse everybody. And also just confuse myself because, again, I, I'm still learning here. I, I'm still trying to figure out what is going on within this industry. But, again, this is just my general, uh, I guess, understanding of, of really what's at play here. So, again, we're going to keep on going on with this consensus mechanism talk over the next couple of days. As I start learning about other, other, other mechanisms, I'm going to try to roll those out. But, again, if we run out of, I guess if we run out of some for now, um, after after five days, six days, whatever it is, I'll just flip over to another concept and hopefully try to rattle off a couple other features and a couple other items within one category for from the from the technical in the technical world to help you guys better understand really what's what's at play. So again, that's it. Thank you guys again. I think this is definitely going a little smoother than it was initially. As as I'm starting to read more about the industry, it's becoming easier for me to speak about things because I'm not really. Uh, Ideas are starting to get cemented in my head. So, again, I really am enjoying these streams. Hopefully, you guys are too. Hopefully, there's going to be a lot more people t tuning into these eventually. I think there could be some value here. I, I hope there's value here. I'm definitely benefiting, I'm definitely benefiting from it in my own ways. So, again, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, check out the dailybit.news. If you want to check out our blogs and Medium, I'm going to start writing on there more frequently. I'm still trying to write there more frequently. Frequently. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, anything that we're doing and you want to get involved in, join the party, by all means, hop over, throw us a follow, throw us a subscribe. But that's really it. Thank you guys so much again, and we'll see you back here tomorrow for Friday session. All right, see ya.